Okay. All right, welcome to the Adorama event space. And this is a solar eclipse photography workshop today. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming and thanks to Adorama for inviting me to speak about uh, solar eclipse photography. I'm Stan Honda. I'm a photographer. I'm based here in New York City. Uh, my, photo, my background's in photojournalism, and I'm uh, currently working on a couple projects. Uh, one is night sky photography and some uh, astronomy-related photography, including eclipses. And uh, the, the other is about the incarceration of Japanese Americans in World War II. I'm working on a book project on that. So a couple different, <laughs> pretty wide, widespread things. Uh, but today we'll talk about um, the eclipse. How many are, are going to actually try to see the total eclipse? All right. Pretty good, uh, pretty good crowd here. That's great. Uh, the first thing I'll mention uh, in terms of guidelines or advice is make sure that you watch the eclipse. Um, everybody here, you're here to learn how to take pictures of it, but uh, it's, it's short. It's, uh, at the most, it's 2 minutes and 40 seconds, and it'll probably be, it might be less where you are. It's, it's as little as 2 minutes long for the, for the totality. And, and if you're fumbling around with your camera equipment, you're looking down at your camera, you're not watching the eclipse. So take time. Make sure you have enough time so that you can, you can look at the eclipse. Um, it's something you'll never forget, and if you you might get a a good, you might get a bad picture. But if you if you don't see the eclipse, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Um, it's something that you really have to experience. That uh, if you if you're looking with your own eyes, you can see the environment around you. You see the sh you're in the shadow of the moon, which is which is a rare event. Uh, the environment around you is going to be changing. People around you are going to be changing. The animals will be changing. So. Uh, it, it's something that you you got to take in with your with just your eyes, just just to see it, because you won't forget that. Um, there, there's going to be a million pictures out there of, of the eclipse, and um, uh, leave it to people like me to worry about uh, trying to get a good picture. <laughs> um, uh, but if you're going to take pictures, you really insist on taking pictures. Uh, know your camera equipment really well. Uh, a lot of the settings you're, you're going to have to know the manual settings on your camera. Uh, the auto settings really aren't going to work. Things like focusing is not going to work very well. You're not going to have time to focus either. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things that uh, if you're well prepared, then you could spend uh, maybe 30 seconds or so taking pictures and the rest actually looking at the eclipse. So that, that kind of should be your main goal should be looking at the eclipse. If it's a choice between trying to figure out why your camera's not taking pictures and looking at the eclipse, look at the eclipse then then because you'll 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 always remember that um, uh, a few tips about eclipse safety which I, uh, i'm sure many of you know about that uh, b before and after the the total phases will be the the partial phases of the eclipse which you, you must wear uh, proper eye protection uh, or or look through a telescope or a camera lens that has a proper filter on it uh, eclipse glasses like these um, are very good these, these little cardboard ones uh, with with the filters in them, uh, they have to be, uh, it has to say safe for direct solar viewing, and it has to have uh, these emblems, like it'll say CE, or it'll say uh, ISO on the, on the filter, uh, both glasses and also filters for telescopes and camera lenses. If it doesn't, if it's not certified uh, by the ISO or CE, then they're not safe, and they don't protect against UV or infrared rays, uh, and so that any um, if it's on a telescope or a camera and you're actually looking through it, you, you could ruin your eyes that way. So uh, make sure that you get safe uh, filters. And uh, for, for photography, for camera lenses, uh, don't use uh, neutral density filters. They're, they're not safe uh, for solar, uh, to shoot the partial phase of a solar eclipse or to do any solar photography because they're not safe against uh, UV rays. If you look through your camera lens, you're, you're, you might have damage to your eyes. Uh, so, so just just be careful, and because uh, I want everybody to be safe and and have a good a good e eclipse uh, experience. When you put on the uh, when you put on the glasses, you can look you can look at the sun uh, before it gets uh, before the total part of the phase. Or if you're if you happen to be here in New York or another part of the country where there's just the partial phase, you can look at the eclipse uh, th through the glasses. Uh, don't ever uh, wear the glasses and look through uh, binoculars or a telescope that isn't that doesn't have a filter on it. That that's probably the worst thing you could do because the the 
lenses on a, on a telescope or binoculars or camera lens will focus the, the sun uh, r right on the plastic. It will burn a hole through the plastic and it, it will damage your eye. So don't, uh, al always make sure if you're looking through a telescope or a camera lens that there is a filter, a safe filter on, front, on the front of the lens. Um, and, that, and that way you'll have a good e eclipse viewing experience. Uh, some of the, uh, a good place to get uh, these filters, uh, uh, the best place I think is uh, one called Thousand Oaks Optical. Uh, they're, as you can imagine, that they're, uh, ha they have a lot of back orders now. And out, of, out of stock, it, like for my lens, 72 millimeter, I mean, it looks like it's out of stock, so after August 15th. Well, what, what, what you need to get is something called the, um, either um, black polymer, or this is called solar light. It's a sheet. Uh, of essentially plastic, and uh, and th this is certified safe for uh, telescope viewing. So you could put this on a telescope, and you could view solar viewing. You could view the eclipse, and it's very safe for your camera lens. They come. This is half of a sheet. They come in different size sheets. Uh, the one I get is it's 12 inches by 12 inches, and uh, it, for that size, it's 25 dollars. And you could you could cut this up into smaller uh, bits, and then uh, I tape it to the front of my camera lens, and and that's, it, that's a perfectly good so, uh, filter for any kind of solar. Uh, it's called, uh, this one is called a, a silver black polymer. Uh, if you look up the Thousand Oaks Optical website, it's just thousandoaksoptical.com, they'll have a whole array of stuff. They're, they're, they are backordered on a lot of things, so. Uh, but if you check other sources, uh, look for a black polymer sheet that's, that's the ISO or CE certified. Uh, for, for solar viewing for telescopes. The best thing is to look on astronomy-related websites for, for things like telescopes, because that, th those will have the best, uh, the best filters. I, I uh, saw one outfit that, that gets there from Bader, Plan Bader Planetarium, B-A-A-D-E-R Planetarium. Bader's a good company, too. Yeah. Uh, they, they, man they actually manufacture the, uh, the, the filters themselves. Okay. It's basically the same material. This, yeah, it's yeah, this material and the one for the glasses is the same material. So, so there, the glasses are safe, and then the, these these particular filters are are safe for solar viewing. Cindy. Yeah, the uh, the question was about there's been some knockoffs of different solar glasses and filters. The best way to do it is they, they have to be uh, something like I uh, should say ISO or CE certified. And oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it, it should say ISO, uh, or on the other side here it says CE certified, and that 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 just means that they are safe for solar viewing for direct solar viewing, and you could put these glasses on and you can go outside on the sidewalk and look at the sun uh, right now and you're, you'll be perfectly safe. Yeah, they can knock that off, they can do that off, so. Uh, well, th that's true, that's why, uh, get, it from a, get it from a reputable source. Yeah. Don't, don't just right. start going online and start ordering things, so. Um, and and there, like I said, there are a lot of astronomy websites out there that sell uh, safe filters, both for telescope viewing, but they also sell the, the, the glasses themselves. Uh, so I just want everybody to be safe. So let's see. It sounds like everybody knows where the eclipse is. Uh, so if you're not if you're not really sure, or if you're uh, just interested in the areas that you're going, uh, NASA has this great eclipse page, which maybe everybody's looked at, uh, eclipse2017.nasa.gov. Um, uh, on that page, they'll have a lot of general information about the eclipse. Uh, just look under maps and interactive maps, and you'll find this map that has, uh, it's a Google map, and uh, you, could, you could click anywhere on the map, and it will uh, give you details about that particular location. Uh, uh, on this map, you, you see a, a red and a blue uh, line going through. That's the path of totality. So it, it starts in, on the coast of Oregon. It cuts a diagonal across the country. And uh, at South Carolina, uh, it leaves land and heads out into the Atlantic Ocean. So that, that's the uh, actual path of the eclipse. If you uh, click on a spot, you, you, get, uh, you can see where the actual path of totality is. You have to be within the, the blue lines. If you're, if you're inside the blue lines on the map, you'll see a total eclipse. The closer you are to the red line, the longer it will last. 
if you're right on the blue line, sometimes it, it actually lasts only one second because you're or a second or so because you're you're very on the very edge of the shadow. But a, as you go further in, then it, it'll just last uh, a lot longer. Uh, when you click on the map, you get this great uh, uh, window that pops up, and it'll give you all sorts of information about the eclipse at at that particular point, which is what you need. So you find where you're going to be, you click on the map, and it'll give you uh, things like the uh, latitude, longitude, uh, the start of the partial eclipse, start of the total, the end of the total, which are sort of the start and end of the total. That's the, those are the numbers that you probably would want to uh, pay attention to and the end of the partial eclipse. So the, the entire eclipse itself will last a little bit over two hours. Uh, the, the totality, it depends on where you are. In, in Oregon, it's about two minutes or so. Uh, uh, the greatest eclipse is around the southern Illinois and into Kentucky. And that's about 2 minutes and 38 seconds to 2 minutes 40 seconds. Uh, the, the time is the, uh, all these various times in universal time or, or Greenwich Mean Time. So you just need to convert to the time zone that, that you're going to be in. Altitude and azimuth are a, a good for or us, for photographers, because uh, altitude will tell you how high the sun is in the sky at that particular time. So for, um, uh, for Grand Island here in Nebraska, uh, at the start of the partial eclipse, uh, the altitude of the sun is 50.6 degrees. So that's pretty high. 45 is halfway up in the sky, so 50 is a few more degrees above that. At the start of total eclipse, it's 59.9, .9, so about 60 degrees up in the sky. And then the end of the partial phase, so it doesn't really dip down too much. Uh, it, it ends at 59 degrees. So uh, that, that'll give you a, a lot of information as to how high it will be in the sky where you are, which helps out with your planning. Uh, another tool you could use for planning is something called the Photographer's Ephemeris, uh, TPE. Uh, it's on the web, web at uh, photoephemeris.com. And you just look up the Photographer's Ephemeris, and you'll be able to get to the, the, the page. It's, it's both for your computer, and they have mobile a uh, apps also uh, for your phone. It's a really, it's a really great uh, program because you pinpoint a location. Uh, this is uh, Central Park on the day of the, of the eclipse. And it'll show you, this, this line shows you, at, well, both the sun and the moon. It, it, it shows you the sunrise and sunset, and the moonrise and the moonset. And as you, uh, as you scroll this, uh, this icon across the bottom of the page, you can go from uh, morning till night. And these uh, lines will rotate uh, depending on where the moon and the sun is in, in the sky. So at any given time, it'll show you exactly which direction the sun is from your location, and the box down here will show you the the uh, altitude information, where where the how high the sun or the moon is in the sky. So this is at about two, uh, I think two forty, two forty four in the afternoon, which is the greatest part of the eclipse in New York City. So if you're standing on the Great Lawn in Central Park, the sun will be in this direction. The sun and the moon will be in this direction. The sun will be partially eclipsed uh, at a altitude of uh, 53 degrees up, up in the sky. So if you're here and you want to take pictures of the, of the sun, you'll know, that you'll know exactly where it'll be in the, in the sky. Uh, another program that I use for a lot of my planning, both for, uh, uh, both for the eclipse, but also a lot for the night sky photography that I'm doing, is Stellarium. And that's a free planetarium program uh, that's really excellent. Uh, I, I use it for all sorts of uh, planning. And you, could, you put in your location. Uh, that make sure the time is correct on your computer for that particular time zone. And it'll show you uh, any time in the past or, or the present or the future what's up in the, in the night sky, what's up in the daytime sky. Again, this is uh, uh, 240, 242 in the afternoon from, from New York City, the New York City location, how high the sun's going to be. You can, put a, you can actually put a grid on this. Uh, there's a selection where you put a, a grid that'll show you the altitude and the compass setting of each of the objects in the sky. So that, that's really helpful in the planning. Uh, for me, planning is really a big, uh, big thing. If you could kind of pre-plan a lot of things and visualize how things are going to be, then it, it, it makes it a lot easier once you get to the site where you're going to actually view the eclipse. So if you're, if you're in your north, you'll see a partial eclipse. Uh, this is a partial eclipse in November of 2013 from Carl Schurz Park. Uh, right at sunrise, there was a partial eclipse of the sun. That, well, for us, it lasted about five minutes because the sun 
uh, just above this frame is a big bank of clouds. And after the sun rose, uh, we saw it for about five minutes, and it disappeared into the clouds. And, and that was it for the solar observing for the day. Uh, but, but it appeared right on the horizon, partially eclipsed. Uh, so, so that was pretty interesting. Uh, this is a more traditional look at a partial eclipse. This was shot from uh, uh, Cleveland in 2014, October 2014, uh, on the shore of Lake, Lake Erie as the sun was uh, setting that day. And so if you're, uh, if you're at the total eclipse, what you'll see is you'll start to see a partial eclipse. The moon will take a little bite out of the sun, and uh, it, it'll really be one of these amazing natural phenomena where the Earth, the moon, and the sun are aligning uh, within their, their orbits uh, and, and creating this eclipse. The, the moon, of course, um, as we know, the, the moon is much smaller than the Earth, much, much smaller than the sun, uh, but because of the distance of the sun from the, from the Earth and that the moon is much closer than the sun, uh, in the sky they're almost the same angular size. They're, they're both about a half a degree in width. If you, if you look up in the sky and, and you divide the sky into uh, 360 degrees, the, the moon and the sun are about a half a degree. And when the, the orbits align, uh, the, uh, an eclipse happens, whether it's a partial eclipse. Uh, and annular eclipse is where you, the, the moon is at the furthest part in its, in its orbit and so that it doesn't completely cover the face of the sun and you, get, you essentially get a ring. Uh, you, so you, you still see a little bit of the face of the sun and a total uh, solar eclipse is when the moon completely covers the face of the sun and you see the corona, which is the outer atmosphere of, of the sun. You don't, you don't actually see the, the actual face of the sun. So if you're out on, in your, um, on your location, where it sounds like most people will be, you'll start to see a partial eclipse and then the, the, one of the very last things you'll see through the eclipse glasses or through your safely filtered camera or telescope is a very small crescent sun. Yeah? When you see this star, is that a sunspot that you observe this star? Uh, th this, is a, uh, this was a huge sunspot on the, on the sun that happened. The sun was pretty active toward the end of 2014. Uh, and so as the eclipse got, the data of the eclipse got closer, people were hoping they could actually see the eclipse with some sunspots. And it, it actually worked out. Uh, I was with a group of uh, amateur astronomers in Cleveland, and we were looking through the, through the glasses, through the eclipse glasses, and through the glasses you could actually see the sunspot with your, with your naked eye. What, so it, it was that big. It was just this massive sunspot, I think one of the largest that's been on the sun in the last few years. And of course it showed up pretty well in, in the photographs. So you'll see this, uh, this tiny crescent, uh, uh, and then the, the, uh, this was about a, probably about a minute before uh, totality. And then uh, it, it'll almost be like somebody will shut the lights off, because the next thing you'll see is a, is a total e eclipse sun. Uh, right as the moon is crossing the, uh, covering the face of the sun, there'll be something called the diamond ring effect. So it'll create this uh, a bright flare on one side of the sun which is the, the last bit of the face of the sun that, that you'll be able to see and, and photograph. Uh, as the, as the to totality progresses, you'll be able to photograph the, uh, the, the corona is this lighter part around the sun, the, the outer atmosphere of the sun. And then you, you'll see these uh, little red spots along the, mainly along this, this side of the sun. Uh, those are prominences, uh, big flares that are coming off the side of the sun. Uh, and this was from um, the eclipse of March of 2015. I was in a, uh, the, the northernmost town in the world, Longyearbyen, on the island of Spitsbergen, in an uh, uh, archipelago of islands called Svalbard, which is uh, clo closer to the North Pole than it is to Norway. So we were, we were at 78 degrees north latitude, so we were pretty far north. Um, it was the, the eclipse went through the Arctic region, and the only bits of land that it hit was Svalbard and the Faroe Islands off of Iceland. Uh, we were pretty lucky in Svalbard. It was completely clear sky. Uh, it was two degrees Fahrenheit, though, so it, it, it was, the, the weather was a little, a little chilly, uh, but uh, the, the sky was completely clear, so we got, we got pretty I lucky. Right, yeah, yeah, in Europe you could see a big partial eclipse. Yeah, yeah. Sydney. Uh, these were all taken with a 400 millimeter lens that I, that I, I later then cropped the photos uh, a little bit to, to bring up the sun a little bit more. And I'll talk all about focal lengths and everything uh, in a couple minutes. And so the, the, the initial exposures, you can get things like prominences that are coming off the, 
uh, off the edge of the sun. Uh, and this is, this is with a longer exposure, you just get a, a lot more of the corona. Yeah, you might have seen, uh, and, and with, a, with an even longer exposure, you, can, you get more and more of the corona. The corona itself is fairly dim, uh, and so the, uh, much, much dimmer than the actual face of the sun, which is why we, we never see it during, during the, uh, when, the, when there is an eclipse. The only time we can actually see it with our eyes is during a solar eclipse. Toward the end of totality, then you see uh, another, uh, at the other end, there's another diamond ring effect where you get this, this little flare of the of, uh, face of the sun as, as the moon is coming across. So uh, these are with a, with a telephoto lens, a 400 millimeter telephoto lens. I, I use uh, uh, the Nikon D800 cameras. Uh, so so uh, how many people here use the full frame cameras? So a few. And then so the rest of you are using the smaller 35 millimeter cameras then. So there's, there's, I'll talk a little bit about the differences between lenses. Pardon? The APS-C? The APS-C, cam yeah, the crop, the crop sensor cameras. So uh, with both kind of cameras, you can get great pictures of, of an eclipse. So, so don't worry about that. Uh, but you have to decide what kind of picture you want. Do you, do you want a close-up picture of the sun, uh, which is nice. Everybody seems to want that. Uh, but all these eclipses look kind of the same when you see uh, th this picture of the, of, of the eclipse that I shot in 2015 isn't a whole lot different than most total solar eclipse pictures uh, taken with long telephoto lenses. Yeah, it, it's, it's great to have, but it doesn't really say where you are or anything like that. Uh, uh, I'm a person that I, for my whole career I've told stories with pictures. Um, that's what I did as a photojournalist. And so the, the one thing uh, that a wide angle lens can do is it can tell you where you were, who you were with, what the environment was like. It'll, it'll tell a story. And it'll be a lot easier, too, uh, somewhat easier to, to, take, uh, to, to uh, shoot the eclipse with. Uh, this is with a 24 millimeter lens on a, that, a little, bit, little bit cropped. But this, all, this tells you where I am uh, in, a, in a pretty stark landscape, uh, ice and snow, uh, a few mountains. And, and there's the, there's the e uh, total eclipse sun uh, in, in the center of the photo there. Uh, a lot of people ask, well, how, how dark does it get? And uh, the one way you could tell is uh, it's like a very, very deep twilight. You could see the, uh, uh, the screens on the backs of people's cameras and computers. And, and it, it's dark enough where those show up in, in, in the photo. That's what these lights are here. And then there's some lights from a, uh, a building across the way there. So it, so it, it does get fairly dark. And, and so it's, it's, it'll be, it's, it's kind of a shock because you won't be able to see some of the controls on your camera. You'll, you'll have to adjust for that. Um, and uh, so I took, a, took kind of different variations. And this picture was the astronomy picture of the day. NASA has a website that uh, every, every day astronomers, a couple of astronomers uh, pick an interesting photo related to astronomy. And I submitted this one. And they, they like this one for the, the day after the eclipse uh, as the APOD picture uh, of the day. So the other thing you could do with, uh, with e eclipses, especially with wide angle lenses, is to do uh, a time lapse uh, composite. So this is the entire eclipse uh, in, front, in Svalbard from beginning to end. So the, from the beginning far partial phase uh, to totality and then all the way to the very end. It takes a lot of patience. You've got to be in one spot. Your camera has to be on a tripod. You can't move your camera for the entire two to two and a half hours of the eclipse. Uh, and so you just have to be patient and wait and wait till it's over to be able to look at look at all the pictures. But but if you're patient enough, you could you can assemble something like this. Th these are individual frames, and then I assembled later on in uh, uh, in the image processing, which I'll do a little demonstration on that uh, in the second half. So can you use a tracker to follow the tripod? No, because what you want you you want to see the sun going across your frame. You don't want to you don't want to track the sun. You, you want it going across the environment because that's what it's doing in real life. Is from your perspective, the sun is starting on one end, one end, and going going across the sky, uh, and an end, ending uh, maybe uh, uh, 30 degrees or so from where it, where it started. Uh, and so, what I what I do is I, I shoot a photograph uh, every minute. I have a timer where it automatically just shoots a picture every minute, uh, in case there's a cloud, or in case something. Uh, is happens to one of the images, and then uh, this is this is uh, this is the sun every five minutes. So I, I choose, pick a frame every five minutes, <laughs> and then uh, assemble that uh, later on in uh, in Photoshop. I think there's a question. Uh, sure. For uh, this eclipse, uh, the altitude is going to be like 15 degrees. 
Yes. Is this going to be common for uh, this kind of eclipse? Yeah, for this eclipse, uh, depending on where you are, the, the sun could be as high as 60 degrees in the sky. So the challenge is, is getting a wide enough angle lens to take in both the sun and the, and the landscape. So I'll talk a little bit about lens angles uh, in, in a while. And so that could be, a, we were pretty fortunate in Svabard because being at such a high latitude, the, the sun at high noon was 11 degrees above the horizon. So we just had to stand there and look straight at the horizon and you could, you could see the eclipse. It was, it was fairly easy compared to, I talked to other people who had seen other eclipses and for example this one, you'll, you'll be looking high up in the sky to see the actual totality, which is another reason to try to keep your camera set up as simple as possible because your camera will be down here and the sun's going to be up there and you can't do both at the same time. There was a, yeah, in the back. Uh, yes, I showed, I, I showed the close-up photo and the wide-angle photo. So I had two cameras uh, at this eclipse, one with a telephoto lens, one with a, with a wide-angle lens. Um, one thing I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on, if you've never worked, if you have two cameras, how many people have two cameras? How many people have used both cameras at the same time to take something, a once-in-a-lifetime event? You have. And I know you have. With a train. What's that? A train, a moving train. That's a once in a lifetime no, event? No, no, this is a steam train. A steam train. I, I, is it as rare as a solar eclipse? No. Okay. So if you've never used two cameras to do something that's a once in a lifetime event, don't start now. Yeah. That's really, don't start now. That, that's why you, you have to make a decision which lens, which camera you want to use. Because if, if you've done it before, that's fine. If you've never done it, this is not the time to start. Yeah. Because because something is going to go wrong with both cameras and you won't get any pictures. Uh, uh, so if you can concentrate on one camera, one lens, then you'll, then, then you'll get a picture. And you'll be able to see the eclipse. You want to be able to see the eclipse, too. That's, that's the most important thing. And this yeah. camera will work very well during the freezing cold weather, right? Uh, yeah, but the camera worked perfect during the, in, the, in the freezing weather, the two, two degree weather. I don't think that will be a problem during this eclipse. Uh, any, anywhere, I don't think anywhere you, anybody will be, there will be much of a problem with low temperatures at least. Uh, the other thing, the other kind of composites you could make is with the, with the telephoto lenses. I, I, I did the same process. I, every, every minute I took a picture and then later on I picked one. Uh, this is about every 15 minutes I think ju uh, just to make the, uh, make the series a little bit shorter. And then I combined them all in, uh, in, in Photoshop which I could show you later on. Uh, so everybody says, well what, what kind of lens, what kind of lens uh, am I going to need? Uh, here's a comparison that I shot. I went out uh, in the Central Park and uh, was photographing one of the sunspots one day. Uh, this is on a full frame camera. So these are at different focal lengths, uh, starting at 700 millimeters and going down to 200 millimeters. So uh, th uh, the, the, the frame that you see, the outline of the frame is, is the frame on my camera. And so this is the size of, at 700 millimeters and, uh, and down to 200 millimeters. Uh, with the full, with the APS-C cameras, with the uh, if you don't have a full frame camera, then uh, the, the 200 millimeter essentially appears like a th uh, the size of a 300 millimeter sun on your camera, and so you kind of go up one uh, uh, one series to uh, to see what how how big the sun sun will be. So if you have a 300 millimeter lens on your camera, which is something like this, the Nikon 70 to 300 millimeter, if you've got that. Uh, as the telephoto lens, um, you'll get a, a, a size of the sun in between the 400 and 500. It's equivalent to about 450 millimeters. Uh, and so that's, that's plenty big. Everybody says, why well, I need a telescope. I need a giant telephoto lens to photograph the eclipse. And really the answer is no, because you don't want too big of a sun in your picture. Everybody wants to fill the frame with the picture. And, and, and no, you don't, because here's, what, here's why. Um, here's the the sun at 700 millimeters, and then I, I took a, uh, one of the solar eclipse photos that I took in Svabard. Uh, I enlarged it to the size of the 700 millimeter image, uh, and then I processed the uh, corona so that it, 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 I, I lightened it as much as I could to get as much information out. And as you can see on a full frame camera at 700 millimeters, I'm on the verge of cutting off parts of the corona up here. And so you, you're, you're traveling a long ways, and you're spending a lot of time and maybe money 
trying to get a picture of the eclipse, so you don't want to cut off any part of the eclipse. Uh, and, and so for me, I, I'm going to shoot at probably 600 millimeters with my, with my camera because th uh, that you can always crop in. You can't crop out. Y you can't make more of the picture. You can always crop in a little bit. And with most, th most of the cameras, uh, especially if you bought a camera within the last few years, the quality is, is beautiful. You, you, you'll be able to crop in a little bit. You won't lose any quality at all. Don't, don't worry about that at all. Uh, what you want to worry about is you want to make sure you got everything in the picture. Uh, here's that 700 millimeters, uh, and here's, the, here's uh, two of the suns from the Slobard eclipse uh, on, on the full frame. So I was using a, I was actually using this lens, the 80 to 400 millimeter lens, uh, on, on one of my cameras, and so this is the size of the of the sun that I got on on that uh, through the partial phase, and then this is the size of the sun during the total. And so the previous pictures that I was showing you, all I did was uh, I cropped in on the, on the sun during totality and was able to, to get you some pretty nice photos. Unless you plan to make billboard size prints from your pictures, which you may or may not be doing, uh, you'll be perfect. You can make 11 by 14 uh, prints from your pictures, even if you crop in quite a bit, and they'll, they'll look perfectly fine. You're shooting the sun, so it's not, you're, you're shooting at a pretty good exposure. You'll have, you'll have uh, you're not shooting something uh, that's very dim, so you'll, you'll have uh, uh, plenty of data in your picture to make even large prints. Uh, yes? Uh, I'm trying to create a time lapse with my camera. Right. So using an intervalometer. Right. So what are the best settings for the camera? Is it 18 to the end? Okay, I'll talk about settings in a couple minutes for, for, every, for everything, for both, both uh, time lapse and for sing single pictures. And then, of course, the, the, with, the, with the wide angles, you just get, uh, you, you could really get a, a, everything around you. And you could go as, as really as wide as you want. Uh, it, with, with this eclipse, to, to get a, a horizontal wide angle uh, picture uh, might be a little bit tough if you don't have really wide angle lenses. Probably on the APS-C, uh, there's a, this, this Tamron is a uh, 11 to 16 millimeters. And, and that's pretty good because you might need around a 15 millimeter lens or so to get a, a wide enough lens. You could also take a vertical picture, and, and that, then you don't need as wide of a of a lens. You'll get the sun, and you'll get get uh, a lot of the uh, down to the to horizon. It really depends on what kind of picture you want to take, wh what's around you. You can often shoot higher in the sky. If you're with a big crowd of people, you might be able to get down low a little bit and get some people in the picture. There might be buildings around you. There might be trees. There might be uh, uh, mountains around you. So you might not necessarily need a, a super wide angle lens. It really just depends on, on where you are. There's a, here's a couple more uh, wide angle pictures from other eclipses. Uh, this is in, in Indonesia last year. Uh, this is, uh, I'm guessing this is probably uh, about a 20 millimeter lens, uh, judging by the, the size of the sun. Uh, and so uh, these next couple ones are also, these are not taken by me, but other photographers. These are from the Astronomy Picture of the Day website. And this is in Australia in uh, 2012 with the sun a little bit lower. But the, the Indonesian one, the sun's pretty high in the sky there. So this might be similar to what you might be seeing from, from where you are. Uh, I was talking about the Thousand Oaks optical uh, filters again, the, the, uh, the black polymer and the silver black polymer sheets are really good for, for the eclipses. What I do is I just, uh, I just cut them. You, you, can, you can easily cut them into different shapes and sizes. And then um, I just tape them to the front, uh, front of the lenses. And where did I put that? Yeah. Let's see. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Remember where you put your stuff. So I just get uh, two pieces of tape. Uh, this fluorescent gaffer tape is really good because you, you actually see where the tape is. You could use uh, masking tape. This is, the, uh, I think, painter's, painter's tape. This is perfectly fine. Just put uh, some tape and just tape it on the front of your lens. Uh, put, put two more on the side just to make it secure so it doesn't blow off in the wind. And, and that's perfectly good to, to shoot your eclipse. You, you could, um, uh, with a telephoto lens, 
you could use your, uh, find the spot meter in your camera, and you can actually take a meter reading off the, off the sun. It'll be a big enough size. And I'll give you some guidelines for exposures in a, in, in a minute. Uh, but, but that's perf perfectly good. Uh, people have been making some interesting filter holders to, to put on the front. The, the, the main thing is that if you're going to shoot the, the partial face of the eclipse, make sure that you'll, you're able to remove this fairly quickly during totality and so that it somehow it stays on and then, and then you, could, you could replace it uh, when, when it goes back into the partial phase. Because during totality, uh, you could take your glasses off, you could take your filters off, and you could look safely at the sun and you could photograph the sun. In fact, if you're going to photograph the totality, make sure you take the filter off. Otherwise, you'll get a nice black frame, uh, <laughs> which is no good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if it's a different uh, these are the these this is a different that's a different filter than this. Uh, ah, okay. If you get one that's that's silver on one side and black on the other, right. the, the silver side goes out. Right. Uh, it, but but I, I think it doesn't make a huge difference. It just keeps your camera and the lens cooler. The silver would just reflects more than the, than the black. Okay. Okay. But it it'll, it'll work it'll work either way. Uh -huh. Yeah yeah both sides will doesn't. If you put it on the other way, it's not. It's it's going to do the same thing. It'll it'll filter the sun fine. And also, do you usually use new filter because in case there is some like a wrinkle on the. Uh, don't 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 make it too tight. If it's if it's real tight, sometimes it distorts the image. But so it, it can be loose and it, it could be wrinkled. It doesn't matter. That's not going to show up in your picture. Well, about, oh, the surface right now is not the perfect. Right. So usually that, you would bring new to make sure it is clean. The, the, the surface doesn't need to be perfectly flat. If, if there's a couple wrinkles in it, it doesn't matter. It, it, it won't show up in your picture. So, so don't, don't be too ob ob obsessed. Uh, it, you just have to make sure what you should do is before you put it on your camera, hold it up to the sun. Look at the sun. If you see any little pin pinholes, throw this away. Just get rid of it. Cut, cut yourself a new one and, and then put it in. If, there, if there's a couple little if this isn't perfectly flat, it doesn't doesn't matter. It, uh, don't don't worry too much about that. The, the main thing is to ma make sure it's secure on your lens or, or your or a telescope, whatever you're looking through, and that you're able to take it off and put it on uh, pretty quickly. Good. Um, Yes, I, the, the two questions were, how do you know when you could take the eclipse glasses off and the filters off? Um, there, there will be, you, you'll probably be with a pretty big, big group of people. I mean, it, it'd be, I would think it'd be impossible to see this eclipse without about a million of your closest friends. So somebody in the group will be familiar with eclipses. I was with a group where, where uh, a pretty experienced guy said he would, he would yell, filters off, and that's when people would take the filters off. <laughs> Uh, when the sun is at, is when, you, when you're looking through the glasses, or if you're looking through, say, a, teles a telephoto lens, and you see a very, very thin crescent, that's when you take the filters off your camera. Uh, because the about the next 30 seconds will be when you get that diamond ring effect. Uh, and then a a a once you start to see a, a bit of the sun peeking out from behind the moon at the end of the totality, that's when you put your filter back on, and that's when you put your glasses back on. Um, and then the, I'm sorry, what was your, <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the question was just about composing the pictures. I compose the wide angle picture uh, before I put the filter on because uh, when you put the filter on, you just see the sun, you don't see a whole, you don't, you really, you don't see anything else. So compose, compose the, uh, compose your image uh, and, and, then, and then put the filter on uh, and then wait, wait for the eclipse. The best is probably to compose it well before the eclipse and, and then so that everything is make sure everything is tightened down so your camera itself doesn't move so the yeah okay the, the question was about the flash on your camera y yes turn the flash on your camera off <laughs> do not use your flash you don't you're not going to need it for, for anything yeah, you, you won't need a flash. It, it, a flash will just ruin your picture. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, unless you know how to use lighting and all that, uh, I just just turn it off because what what you'll get is you'll get not such a great picture, and you'll say, "I wish I would have turned the flash off." <laughs> so just just keep it off. That, that's that's the best thing to do. Yeah. With the wide angle lens, you can go ahead and use the autofocus, compose your picture, and if you, if you know how to turn your camera to manual focus, then do that. Uh, put a piece of tape over the focusing ring, if, you, if there's one on the lens, turn your camera to manual focus, and then leave your camera like that, because you don't want the camera trying to focus through this filter, because it won't. And what you'll get is an out of focus picture. And, and, and so what uh, my camera set up where I could focus and then it'll, it'll lock on that where I'm focused on, and, and it won't change no matter how much I'm shooting. Uh, so that, that's the way I, I, I set up my cameras. So, but, but yeah, you can use the autofocus to initially compose, set up your picture, but then uh, learn how to turn it to the manual focus, but then don't, if you're gonna do a whole sequence, you gotta leave your camera. You can't, you, you can't touch it, or you can't, uh, uh, otherwise you'll, you'll ruin the, the line of the, of the sun. Uh, let's see. Oh, so uh, exposure, which is the which is the hard part. That that that, that is the hard part. Uh, and everybody says, well, what, what's the exposure for all the pictures that I've taken? I can tell you, but it might not be really meaningful to you because things change. Uh, there's going to be a huge difference uh, where where you are versus where I was in 2015. Where where I was, it was it was winter. Well, it was a kind of early spring. The sky was perfectly clear. There was nothing in the atmosphere. So where you are, there could be haze, there could be, some, there could be thin clouds, there could be smoke from fires. There, there's a lot of different things that could affect the exposure. And so the exposure that I tell you might not be anywhere near the exposure you're gonna do. You're gonna do. It, 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 it'll probably be close. I mean, it's a good starting point. But then don't, don't use the numbers I give you as the exposure for an eclipse. Because you'll have to determine on your own what looks good uh, in, in your camera once you, uh, that's why the best thing is get to your s place where you're going to view the eclipse early so you can, you, it, 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 the sun's up, put your filters on, try some exposure, see what it looks like because then, then you'll have plenty of time to make any kind of adjustments uh, w once you're doing. And it also depends on the equipment you have. I, I use Nikon equipment with Nikon lenses. You've got a Canon that's slightly different. If you're using Sony, that's slightly different. The Tamron lenses are different than, than other lenses. So uh, e each piece of equipment will add a, a slightly different variable to what, what you'll do. Um, but, but given that, a good starting point is that you, you could start at ISO 400, and you could, you could start at a shutter speed of, say, a, a 500th or a thousandth of a second at, at f8. Uh, so it's important to know all of the manual uh, modes on your camera to be able to go to the manual mode, uh, set the ISO, set the shutter speed, set the f-stop uh, uh, manually. And so because you don't want anything to change during the, during the eclipse. Uh, the other thing is that you'll have to change things manually during totality. Uh, so that's the hard part, or the fun part, depending on your point of view. So, uh, and uh, the auto uh, modes on your camera won't work very well during totality. So. Uh, that's the other thing. The, 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 good, the good thing about this is that you could practice a lot leading up to the eclipse. Uh, you don't have to find a dark si site to see stars or anything. You could practice in the middle of the day because you're practicing on the sun. And um, especially with all learning the manual modes in your camera, you could do that anywhere at any time. Uh, uh, so, so, so learn that. Um, the, uh, the exposure that I just gave you is uh, will basically be th through, through the filter uh, that, that if you're going to shoot through a filter. You could, you could also just wait for totality. You could shoot pictures of the people around you with your camera and then you could, you could, you could just shoot for the two minutes of totality and, and then forget about the rest of the eclipse and, and that will be perfectly fine because then you'll be, you, you won't have to worry, worry about taking off or putting on the filter and, uh, and you could just, pre just prepare for that totality. You won't be able to take really any pictures leading up to totality, but if you just shoot totality, then, then, then you'll be okay. Uh, Faisal. What kind of uh, f-stop are you using? What kind of f-stop? Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, well, uh, F8. If, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the exposure that I'm starting out with is ISO 400, uh, anywhere between 500 and uh, one thousandth of a second at F8. Uh, so that's a, that's a good starting exposure. Like I said, don't, it depends on your equipment. That, that, that's, the part, that's during partial. That's during the partial phase through, through a filter. Right, right, right. Okay, and then, and then so what, uh, what during totality, the corona is much, much dimmer than the face of the sun. So you, from this exposure, you'll have to in increase it. If you're just going to shoot totality, you could start at this exposure and then just increase the exposure during, during totality if, if you want. Uh, so uh, as, the, as the sun uh, as it approaches totality, you, you take the filter off of, of the one camera and the one lens that you're going to be using, uh, and you'll have to increase uh, by, at, by at least five or six stops. So does everybody know what that means? What, from if I'm shooting at a five hundred of a second, what's a two stop increase? Anybody? What's a two stop increase? If I'm shooting, if I'm just, if I'm just adjusting the shutter speed, I'm shooting at a five hundred of a second. What's a two stop increase in exposure? One twenty five, one 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 hundred twenty fifth of a second. So six stops would be an eighth of a second. So. Uh, another important piece of equipment that you're going to need is a tripod for this. Uh, uh, what I do is you could, you could change the f-stops if you want, but you're going to run out of f-stops. If, if I'm shooting an f8 and your telephoto lens, like this one, the, max, the, the minimum aperture is f5.6, you go one stop and you're, you've run out of f-stops. You can't, you can't open this lens anymore. I, ISO, you could, you could change the ISO. Uh, but that often takes uh, a, a couple of different things. You might have to press something and change it. The shutter speed is just generally one dial on your camera, and, it's, and if, you, if you reduce everything to just changing one variable during the eclipse, then it'll be a lot there, there's less to think about. There's only one thing to think about, and that's your shutter speed. So if, if you reduce it to that, then, then you'll be okay. Uh, so the, the easiest way is to have your camera on a sturdy tripod, uh, make sure everything is locked so that, that it doesn't move much. If you're shooting through a telephoto lens, uh, if you're shooting the partial phase, you'll, you'll note that you'll have to keep adjusting the lens as you're following the sun across the sky. Uh, during totality, it's only two minutes, so unless you've got a pretty long telephoto, like a 600 millimeter or 500 millimeter, you might not have to adjust the camera at all, which is good because adjusting the camera means you're going to have to be looking through it, adjusting it, and you're not really watching it, you're not watching the eclipse. So uh, if it's a shorter telephoto lens, there'll be enough leeway where it'll move through your frame, but it won't move out of the frame, which is, which is the important thing. So those two minutes, it, it, might, it might move, say, half the distance across your uh, uh, frame, but then it won't, it won't completely move out of the frame, which will, which will be good. Uh, th again, you could... I'll talk a little bit about auto bracketing, which is a really great feature. You could practice on the full moon. Uh, there's a n nearly a full moon tonight. There's a full moon tomorrow, and I think it's going to be rainy and cloudy here. But uh, that, uh, a large moon, once, if you can't do it tonight or tomorrow, later in the week when, when there's still a fairly large moon out, uh, if you're shooting with a telephoto lens, practice on the moon because practice focusing on it and then practice using the slow shutter speed because if the, the, your moon pictures come out sharp, then, then your sun pictures will come out sharp because you're, you're, you'll be shooting at a slow shutter speed. Right. Uh, uh, eighth of a second is an eighth of a second, no matter if you're shooting the sun with a filter or without a filter or the moon at night without a, without a filter. Yeah, so, the reason we see it is there's not much sunlight anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, the, the point is that you want to you make sure that your setup is sturdy enough so that at, at the slow shutter speeds, a thirtieth, a fifteenth, an eighth of a second, that nothing moves. Because if, if, it, if, it, if your moon is sharp, then your sun pictures will be sharp. Yeah. Okay. How about the composing, like say, during totality? So initially, so you, want to, you don't want the sun in the center of your frame, right? Uh -huh. You want to be on the side, so you want to be somewhere where the sun is. Uh, let's see, yeah, the, the question was about composing through a telephoto lens, right? Yeah, yeah and then you, uh, you could put, uh, I guess you could start by focusing and getting the, the metering by putting the sun in the very center of the frame. 
you can move it off to the side a little bit, and then it'll, it'll drift through your frame. Uh, the, the sun goes from east to west across the sky. So you'll be, you'll be facing south, and so the sun will be going this direction across the sky. So you can kind of picture that in your, in your frame. Uh, use the moon, again, as, as a guide. Go out with your telephoto lens, focus on the moon, put it on one side of the frame, leave your camera there, shoot a picture every couple minutes. And you and without moving your camera, and you'll see which way the moon is moving. So if it if you if you put it on uh, on one side, and then a couple minutes later it's gone, then then you're you, you've got it on the wrong side. So you you put it on say the left side, and if it moves toward the right, th then you could kind of judge how how the sun's going to be moving through the sky. That that'd be a good way to judge it. Yeah. What is the auto bracketing feature? Uh, I'll talk about that in, in a minute. That's that's something that's built into a lot of cameras that'll, that'll really help you out. Um, auto bracketing is something that's great. Uh, bracketing, of course, is if, if, you, if you find an exposure, bracketing is, is overexposing and underexposing on each side of that exposure uh, to get a slightly overexposed picture or a slightly underexposed picture. Uh, and one of those exposures actually might be better than what your light meter says as, uh, as being the, what the so-called proper exposure. There's no such thing as, as the best exposure. There's only a good exposure for the subject matter and for the lighting. And so bracketing can go uh, uh, underexposed, uh, overexposed for um, that particular uh, reading. For example, uh, I, I gave you the setting of a 500 at f8. So uh, if I bracket one stop on either side, I could one, one stop uh, overexposed would be 250th of a second, and one stop uh, over underexposed would be at 1,000th of a second. So one, one F stop on either side of, of the shutter speed. For, the, uh, for the, this, the Nikon that I use, there's a, there's a button that says BKT. And that, that might be in the menu of your camera. The, the, the simplest method is to, is to basically slow down the shutter speed of your camera. Uh, usually you could reach that with, uh, with one of the wheels on the camera. And you just, you, get, you just keep slowing that down to the 15th or 8th of a second. Uh, the best thing, though, as you're slowing it down, at, at each interval, take, take a few pictures because you'll get more and more of the corona and there might be a point where you actually might be overexposing it too much, and so one of the intermediate pictures might be better. And, and so in, in this case, you'll 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 get all of them. And if you um, uh, if you're doing say six six different shutter speeds, and you take a few frames from each one of those, uh, you, you'll have plenty of time to be able to view the eclipse as well. Um, so the, uh, one of the other settings is uh, EV steps for, con for um, exposure control. Uh, EV just means exposure value. Most of the cameras are set up to uh, give you an increment of one third of a stop. So when you, um, when you look at your controls, you often see a shutter speed of say a 500th of a second. And if, 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 you're, if you're going uh, down the scale, then the next one might say 400, and the next one is say 320, and then 250th. Um, I'm an old person, so I see, I, I'm used to film cameras. That's, I, I learned on film cameras, and they only had a certain set of shutter speeds. They had nothing in between, so it started at usually a thousandth or 500th, the next one was 250th, the next one was 125th. Each, each of those increments uh, lets in either half the amount of light or lets in twice as much light. So it's, it's, it's this increment of, uh, of, a, of a factor of two. Uh, and so I'm used to those big numbers, the, the full, we, they're generally referred to as full f-stops. Uh, the cameras now, you could, the, the, everything's electronic, so you could create these increments, much smaller increments, which uh, makes it sometimes harder, sometimes easier. It, 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 it can add confusion because it's just a lot more numbers to see on your, on your camera, which uh, in, in this case, you want to get down to five or six stops overexposed pretty quick. If you have that on a third stop increments, you're, you're, uh, you're moving your wheel a lot just to get down to uh, an eighth of a second. So, so that's, a, that's a lot of movement. 
So if there's something that says EV steps for exposure control, you can actually control that. It'll, uh, op, uh, a screen might come up, it'll say one third of a step, which is generally the default, a half a step, which is a half a stop, or one step, which is a one stop difference. If you set that to uh, a one step difference, then if you're starting at a five end of a second, the, the next interval you'll see is 250th of a second, uh, or, or a thousandth of a second on the, on if you're going faster. And so that, if, then if you're starting at 500, you, could go quick, you can go quickly in one stop increments all the way down to one eighth of a second. And so if you're doing this uh, manually on your camera, you could get down to that five or six stops overexposure much, much faster, uh, and that leaves you more time to view the eclipse. Uh, which is our main thing, Bill. Okay, so this is just during totality, you do the bracketing. You don't do that in your wide panoramic shot. R right, the bracketing is just during totality, not, not during the partial phase. The partial phase, the exposure is going to be the same the entire length of the partial eclipse, bo both before and after totality. It's only during totality where the exposure is going to change because there's a lot less light that, that you'll be seeing, a lot less light that your camera will be recording. Um, and on the, on the Nikon, there's this button that says VKT, which is the, the bracketing uh, button. The, the, when it's off, it just says OF. And then uh, what I do is you can set it for, um, looks like it, you can set it for three, five, seven, or, or nine frames, which means that it'll, it'll um, if you can imagine a scale go, going from left to right, uh, so four, it'd be four stops underexposed, and then there'll be the actual exposure, you have it set it out, and then four stops overexposed. And so it'll kind of, it'll, it'll give you that range uh, that, that you'll need. So if I, um, if I'm starting out at, at 500th of a second at F8, and, oops, and I go to uh, the bracketing control, I put it on 9, F, the new shutter speed uh, I see on that, it actually changes your, your, the fastest shutter speed. It, I go to 8,000th of a second because it, it thinks that the 500th of a second is my middle uh, exposure, which is, which is right at that point. But, but I want the 500th of a second to be uh, the, the shortest exposure because I want it to go all the way down to an eighth of a second. So. Uh, so what I, what then you'll have, you'll actually have to manually change this back down to 500th. And since you have it on the one step increment, the one stop increment, you can go a lot faster from 8,000 down to 500. And then you start, th then what, then you can start shooting pictures. So the first frame it shoots is a 500th of a second. The next one is 250th, 125th, 60th, 30th. It's doing this all automatically, 15th, eighth of a second, fourth of a second, a half a second. Then? And then so the next one is 500th of a second. Yes. Would it help to put your camera on aperture priority? No, the problem is is that you you don't know you don't know the actual brightness of the uh, sun. Yeah, yeah, right. And and so you don't know you don't know how much of the corona that you want to get. Uh -huh. And so any kind of automatic exposure, it's tri automatic tries to make it gray. Uh. Uh, and then even if you do the exposure compensation it, it would work with the exposure compensation if you knew how bright the corona is. Right, right, right. But, no, no. but because of differing atmosphere, smoke, clouds, haze, anything, you don't know exactly how bright okay. the corona is from where you are. Yeah. And so uh, an auto exposure might get you close, but, but this kind of reassures you that you'll, you'll get a range of exposures yeah, that, yeah. that'll be pretty good and that you'll definitely get much more of the corona uh, than, than, um, than with, say, with an auto setting. Yes. So do you do video to the whole uh, eclipse? You could. I mean, I don't, I, I don't do much video, so I don't, I'm not really, uh, I don't really know much about the video settings that, that you would do. But, but yeah, that, that's, you could do, you could do video through, uh, for the, yeah, because. Yeah, you'd have to make some compensations during totality, but yeah, you definitely could do video. Yes. Uh, 
uh, is there a limit for the number of frames? What the bracketing, the, li the limit for this camera is nine, nine frames. Yeah. And so um, uh, the, the, the other method you could do, uh, aside from the bracketing, you could, you could sort of manually bracket is that you have it set, you're starting at a five hundredth of a second, and then uh, you could just manually change, slow the shutter speed down to two fiftieth and just keep going, shooting a couple pictures at each increment that you do because each, uh, as you open up the exposure, you'll get more and more of the corona and that you'll, you'll find, once you look back over your pictures, you'll find the one uh, picture of the corona that, uh, that, that looks good for you. Uh, if you're shooting with a telephoto lens, uh, shoot a few pictures at the setting that you have during, with the filter on uh, because that'll that'll be able to you'll be able to get any prominences that are that are like I showed you earlier the little red prominences that are coming off, and that's good at the really short exposure. And then and then you start slowing the shutter speed down to get to get more and more exposure to get the corona. Yeah. Yeah. The best thing uh, uh, I think I was talking going to talk about equipment. Uh, you could, uh, if you've got a, a remote shutter release that you use for, uh, uh, well, I use it a lot for night sky photography. That's perfect for this because you don't, especially with the slow shutter speeds, you don't really want to be touching your camera or the lens. And so if you've got a, a wireless, especially a wireless remote, something like that, uh, that would be great to attach to your camera uh, because then you could, you'll still need to be manually changing. It, it, unless you do the bracketing, you'll still need to be manually changing but you could, you could have the uh, release in one hand and you could sort of be doing the shutter, uh, changing the shutter speeds uh, with, with your other hand. Um, let's see, but yeah, the, the uh, remote release is, would be perfect for uh, photography like this. Uh, and so they, they, what you want is to be able to just slow down, the, uh, increase the exposure as much as you can to, to get more uh, of the corona itself. So this is uh, Sydney. Uh, oh, uh, should you use your phone or should you not use it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the question was just about using a, your phone as an app with a lot of people. Uh, I, I'm not sure what would happen when, if there's a lot of people. I, I, the remote controls that I have, you could set different frequencies. So uh, my idea is to try to get, obviously try to get a frequency that nobody else is on <laughs> so that, so that I'm, I'm just controlling my, my cameras that way. But yeah, that, that could be a problem because a lot of the uh, remote controls are, are pretty popular now and people I know that a lot of the stores are, are selling out of them because pe I think people are buying them for the, for the Eclipse. So that, 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 I think the best thing is just to, uh, it, it's hard to figure out what to do. The, uh, uh, obviously a wired one, one that's actually wired to your camera would be the safest to go because then there's no, there's no radio interference. Uh, and then if you use it uh, like, you're, like you're doing a slow shutter speed, then that's, that's perfectly good. Uh, I'll show you the difference between a couple of exposures. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, I, I've just taken the filter off my telephoto lens uh, to shoot the, the totality. So this was a 250th second at f11. And then, then I slowed it down. I, I made the error of, uh, of not adjusting the, the uh, EV value on my camera. So I was doing the bracketing and it just, it just went down to a 40th of a second. So it would have been better if this were more like I think more toward an eighth or a fourth of a second to get a lot more of the corona. Uh, but there's still quite, since it's daylight, there's still quite a bit of, of data in the, in the picture itself. And the same with the wide angle. Uh, the original picture was fairly dark because at, at a 30th of a second, it was, it, was, it was underexposed by a couple of stops, but I was able to, to lighten it a little bit. A as the eclipse went on, this was the, the APOD picture, you could see a little bit of the sun starting to, to peak around here. Uh, what's, which is called third contact, and then so this, but this is, I also had slowed the shutter speed down to an eighth of a second at this point, so it, it got a lot more of the brightness in the landscape uh, area. If you're going to do the, uh, some of the uh, com composites, uh, this was a, an annular eclipse uh, shot from New Mexico, 
and 2012. Uh, and this is when the, the moon is at, at a far, the farthest point in its, in its orbit. And so it doesn't co completely cover the face of the sun. It, it creates this small circle during totality. This is actually the, the total phase right down there. Uh, and so this is also a, a composite of the sun taken every five minutes. And then I just, I just uh, compiled that in, in Photoshop. Uh, this was a 48 millimeter lens, so about a 50 millimeter is really a, actually a, a good for an, e an eclipse sequence on a full frame camera. You might not be able to do that since the sun is fairly high in the sky depending on, on, on where you are. This is uh, with a wider angle with a 24 millimeter lens, so I was able to get a, a lot more of the, uh, of, of the environment itself. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the image processing, putting all that together. Anybody have any more questions on the exposure or? Oh, yeah. uh, oh uh, I will be in Madras, Oregon. It's central Oregon, uh, mainly because of the, the weather forecasts are generally good for that area for <coughs> late, late August. So I'll be, I'll be way out on the, on the other coast. There's a question. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh. Oh well, uh, you you probably need if you were going to get uh, a sequence like this, you probably need a pretty wide angle lens, r roughly about a 15 millimeter lens, to do to do a horizontal picture. I'll do a little demonstration with with a couple of lenses that I have, and and I could show you that. But if you but you can also shoot a, a, a vertical picture, with. The, the widest lens you have, and you'll probably get most uh, uh, a lot of the, the uh, horizon I in the photo in a, in a vertical picture. So sort of think about that. I'm not sure what that was. <laughs> uh, hang on one second, and uh, do I use the uh, the mirror lockup at all? Not not really. You don't really for the solar eclipse. You don't need it. At the slow shutter speeds, it might help, but it's just one more thing to, uh, to worry about and one more thing to do. If there's some sort of automatic way of doing it on your camera, then go ahead and do that. But uh, if, if there isn't, don't worry too much about it. If you've got it on a tripod and you're using a remote release, uh, you should be okay with, with any kind of mir mirror movement. Uh, again, if you uh, go out and shoot pictures of the moon, and if your moon looks pretty sharp, then, then, you're, then you're okay. So. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the doing the uh, time lapse sequences. Uh, what you'll need is you need your camera on a tripod, uh, and then you'll need to do the c compose your picture so that you see whatever you want to see, and that you know that the sun's not going to go out of the frame. Uh, and then uh, you'll you'll start shooting the clips with your filter on. Uh, make sure that you have it on in a way that you'll be able to um, remove it remove it and then re put it back on during totality, but also not moving the camera at all. So you have to be, you have to be very careful a as to how you remove it, how you put it back on, and then if you're changing the, sh the shutter speeds also during totality, uh, you make sure your camera's not moving at all because you'll, uh, then, uh, uh, then you'll have to, you have to, you can manually move around things in when, you, when you layer these pictures it's just a lot harder. So if you if you've got a nice sequence and nothing's moving around, then it's just a lot easier to uh, to do it in in Photoshop. So this is um, yeah. For the wide release, it's okay, but if you put the image very sharp, is there an impact? Yeah, it, yeah, it should. As long as you're not pulling on the wire, uh, the best thing is to keep keep a lot of slack in the wire. Uh, stay close to your camera and, and, and use that. Uh, and again, you could, you could uh, test it on something like the moon. Go out and shoot pictures of the moon. If everything looks sharp at the shutter speed you're, you're shooting at, then it, then it should be. Uh, so this is a, a test I did out at Carl Schurz Park. Uh, I was out there for hours uh, shooting the, the, the length of the eclipse and also sort of testing the lens to see how, how much I get in the lens if I'm going to cut off anything. Uh, and so. I shot uh, a lot. I think I shot about 150 in inches. Because what I do is, I'll set the camera to shoot uh, a frame every minute. I'll, I'll use the remote timer uh, or the inter intervalometer, and you set you can set it for uh, well uh, a long exposure, which of course you don't need, and you can set it for for the, the interval. And the interval that I set it at is one minute, 
so that every minute my camera will shoot a picture uh, of, of the sun. With the wide angle lens, of course, you don't have to adjust anything. You, you, you set it up and you want to leave it where it is. You don't want to touch it. You, you set it and, and then it'll just run through the two hours or so, two hours plus of the eclipse. What you'll get is a whole series of uh, black pictures with a little dot in it. And at first you might think, well, there's, I didn't shoot anything. Uh, but as you go through the pictures, you see the little sun uh, rising up through the air. Uh, so this was shot from about 8.20 in the morning to about uh, 10.40, I think, uh, or, or earlier last week. So, and then uh, in the middle, I took the filter off, uh, re sort of uh, preparing for the, the, total the total part of the eclipse. I put the filter back on and then shot it more until about 10.40, until the, the sun was at the, at the peak where it would be during the eclipse. And you can see it's pretty close to the edge of this frame, so I, I, I'm glad I didn't lower the, the frame anymore. This is a, a 20 millimeter lens on a, on a full frame camera, and I'll show you the, the actual frame uh, that I was composing uh, in, a, in a couple minutes. So, and so what I'm showing you here is not every minute, but uh, I chose a frame from the very start, then the next frame I chose was five minutes after that one. And, and after that, then the next, the, uh, the next five minute mark. And so I these are images every, every five minutes. That seems to be, to me, the, kind of the, the, the best sequence where the sun is far enough apart and during the eclipse, you, you see enough of the sun disappearing from image to image that you could, you would, you could get the sense of an eclipse uh, uh, at the very start, the totality, and then the moon receding from the face of the sun. Yes? How about if you would keep a filter off, so it didn't burn your camera sensor? No, because uh, uh, people take pictures of the sun all the time with wide-angle lenses. You, um, uh, this is a, uh, a DSLR, so there's a mirror that, uh, that's in front of the shutter, so if the, if, the, if the camera's pointed at the sun, it's not hitting the shutter at all. If you've got a mirrorless camera, though, uh, be very, very careful when you're shooting the sun, though. Don't keep it pointed at the sun unless you've got the filter on or uh, unless you have a lens cap on. So it, if you've got a mirrorless camera, uh, you can only sh point it at the sun at a very short, a few seconds. Uh, d don't, don't leave it pointed at the sun because then you could, you could damage your shutter. Uh, the, the, the lens could, uh, could focus the sun on your shutter and you could, you could damage the shutter or your sensor. But if you've got a uh, a single lens reflex like this camera, then then you're fine. You're, uh, you're with the with the DS DSLR with the telephoto is fine because you're not the the, uh, the the sun is going off the mirror through into your viewfinder. Uh, but it, so it, if you got a telephoto lens on it, don't compose the picture without the filter on. You got to have the filter on your lens to actually c compose the picture. With the wide angle. You can go ahead and compose the picture without the filter because uh, I don't know if anybody's shot pictures of the sun with wide-angle lenses, but it's kind of a dramatic effect. And it's, and it's, it's very easy with the DSLR cameras. Uh, you just have to remember not to look at the sun a lot with your, while you're looking through your camera. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's perfectly fine. Bill. So you said you were shooting one every minute, but you were choosing one every five minutes. Right. Yeah. Does that kind of screw up your evenly spaced montage? Well, one minute over, or is that so close that it doesn't really matter? Yeah, yeah. Bill's asking about how the, the if there's a cloud on one frame, does that screw up your montage? What uh, it, it, this is slightly labor intensive because uh, you have to look at all uh, 120 or 150 pictures that you shoot because if there's a cloud in one, you kind of have to el you el you eliminate that time frame, and and then so. So then you choose, you, you essentially, the, the five minutes can go uh, at any point along that whole spectrum. So you, 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 then you just choose a different time frame and then so that, then, then you, you do have a, a, a sun every five minutes and the spacing you know, becomes even. Uh, and so if there's a couple of clouds out there during, at, from your location, you might have to make a few decisions. Some, I, I, I've seen a few where uh, there's, um, you can kind of see that there's a cloud over the sun in, in, in one of the sun images. And so it, 
uh, I mean, it's not a, obviously it's not your fault because you're not can't control the weather, but uh, you just have to sort of make an aesthetic decision uh, as to how the sequence uh, will look. Yes. Yeah, during totality, do I manually, I, yeah, I, I do the, the setup that I told you that I described a little bit earlier about change the exposure. That's what you have to do during totality. You have to take the filter off, uh, you have to manually change the exposure, and then you change, you, you remember the original exposure that you had, write it on a piece of paper or a piece of tape and tape it to your tripod or tape it to the back of your camera because you're going to forget that exposure. And if you're going to do a sequence, of any kind, you, you, need, you need to get back to that original exposure, the exact exposure. Otherwise, it's just a lot more hassle on your computer. And so I, I'm just trying to make things as simple as possible. So if you've, if you've got that exposure written down, then you don't necessarily need to remember it. So then you just match up whatever you've written with your camera, and then you just keep shooting the rest of the, the clips. If you're just shooting totality, then, of course, then you don't really need to remember anything because you're not you're not continuing shooting at all. Yeah, you could do. Yeah, yeah, you you could shoot as much as you want. The more you shoot, the more you have to look through. Uh, you, you could shoot if you shoot every second. You could theoretically make a make a video from it. Uh, and, and the, the, also the question was about memory. Memory cards are very inexpensive now. If you don't have more than one memory card, go back there after the workshop and buy two. Because they're, buy two 16 or 32 gig memory cards because they're not going to be expensive. If you run out of memory, you'll kill yourself. So, so don't, j just go back and buy a couple cards. And make sure you've got extra memory cards. The morning of the eclipse, You'll probably have shot a lot of pictures the day before the eclipse. The morning of the eclipse, put in a brand new card, a blank card, rather. Put in a blank card into your camera so that you have a, an entire card. You're not going to fill it up, but at least you won't have a lot of other pictures uh, filling up the space there. Uh, in the back? No, no. Uh, like I said, for an eclipse, everything's got to be manual. No matter what you're doing, it's manual. So that's why learn, if you don't know the manual mode in your camera, go home right now and learn it. Read the, man, read the owner's manual. Sh go out and shoot pictures and, in the manual mode. Shoot it so that you understand how to change the shutter speed, how to change the f-stop, how to change the ISO. And then, and then uh, use the guidelines that I gave you for the exposure so you could change it manually because that's the only way to guarantee that you'll get a successful picture. I mean, I, I'm not guaranteeing that you'll get a successful picture, but it's, it's the only way to uh, assure that you'll, you'll, you'll get a good picture of the, of the corona and you'll, uh, because you don't, want, you don't want the camera to start making changes in the exposure uh, that's out of your control or during parts of the eclipse that you don't want any changes uh, uh, made. So uh, that's, why, that's why you shoot in manual. Yeah. Do you use camera with two Pardon? Do you use camera with two cards? Do I use cameras with two cards? Uh, yes. And you, you don't need to do that. What I, what I usually do when I'm shooting something important, I'll put two cards in it. The second card uh, I'll, I'll, uh, you could, you could uh, treat as a backup card. So it, it records everything that the first card does. So then immediately I have two, uh, essentially two sets of photos of the same thing. And, and so you could do that. Uh, the main thing is to have a, a large enough card where you don't have to worry about running out of space. So here's our, yeah. That's probably what I'll be using on a full frame camera. Uh, I'll be using a six, probably a 600 millimeter on the uh, full frame camera uh, for the telephoto. For the wide angle, I'll probably be using around a 20 millimeter. I have a 16 to 35 millimeter zoom uh, that I'll probably shoot at. Uh, and what's, what's, I did this test at 20 millimeters. So if, let me get through this test and I'll show you what it looks like at 20 millimeters. Uh, so you've got all, all your pictures here. And the, 
here's, the, here's the scene at 20 millimeters um, at, uh, where the sun is at the height of totality, uh, at, at, at the altitude of totality. Uh, this is from Carl Schurz Park and uh, uh, look, looking east in the morning. Uh, this is not the uh, original picture. I, I processed this a little bit. I darkened this slightly. I think I lightened the sidewalk a little bit. Uh, so you, you could, with, with the pic one picture from the totality, that looks good. That'll essentially be your uh, well, background picture. It's, it's really your foreground picture, but it, in Photoshop it's treated as the background. So this will be the picture that the sun pictures are layered on top of. And, and so you could, you could choose this. There are a couple different ways you could do this. There's, there's about a million different ways you could, you could photograph and process anything. Um, uh, these couple ways I, I, I think are fairly straightforward. You could choose your picture. You process it the way you want, you want it to look. Uh, uh, how dark you want the sky. The, uh, a lot of it is processing is really taste. Uh, what you see in the picture, what you experienced when you're um, what your memory is. You get home and you think, uh, wow, it was dark out there. I remember it being in dark. Yeah, you'll be able to see, um, uh, depending on where you are, if the sky is clear, you'll be able to see Venus. You might be able to see a couple other planets during the eclipse itself. The sky will be that dark. And so uh, you, you uh, lighten or darken the picture like you remember it. Uh, uh, and uh, it, there's no one way to do it. It's, it's, it's just really how you want to present the, the final image. So you could do that, and then make, and then that'll be that's part of your whole series. That that's one picture in the, in the whole series. Pick just one. I mean, you don't want two suns in your picture. You just you just want one that's that's eclipsed, and that'll be essentially the center image of of the sequence. And so that's what you see here. You see uh, the, the the series of the suns every five minutes. Uh, at at the point of totality, uh, I I took off the uh, filter and then put the filter back on and shot for another hour and 10 minutes or so. Uh, so there's a program called um, StarStax. It's S-T-A-R-S-T-A-X. Uh, it, it's used to make star trails. And the, the concept between star trails and a time lapse of, of an eclipse is very similar. It, it's, just, it's just a sequence of images that you want to combine together. If you can imagine all of your image is as pieces of paper. And so what you're doing is you're just putting one on top of the other and putting that on a bigger stack of pictures. So you're, 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 you're just stacking all of these together into one big stack of pictures and making that, making that one picture. That's why it's very important to have a sturdy tripod. Um, recheck your controls. Is everything, everything uh, locked tight so that nothing moves? Because if nothing moves, then you've got a perfect sequence and you don't have to do anything, uh, any kind of adjustments when you're on, on your computer. Uh, there's also an, a method if you're familiar. How many people work here in Lightroom? How many in Photoshop? Um, how many ha have the, the Adobe CC uh, uh, suite and they have Lightroom and you're not working in Photoshop? Because if you, if you have a, uh, Adobe CC and you're working in Lightroom, you're paying for Photoshop anyway. So the best thing is just to, uh, Photoshop is just more powerful and you can use Lightroom to browse through your pictures if you want. Uh, Photoshop is just a better program to actually process the images to work, work on them. Uh, but this one called StarStacks is pretty good. Uh, you, you, op you open up, you select images to be processed. If, if, the, uh, if the totality image is the way that you want it to look, the way that you, the brightness and all that, uh, leave that in the folder there. You can select all of these. And then you click on open. And on the, on the left side, you'll just see all your, the, the whole list of images there. There are 25 here, 24 partial eclipse on one side, I mean 12 on one side, uh, 12 on the other, and then the total uh, eclipse uh, background picture in, in the middle. So once those are all in, uh, the blending mode over here, uh, there's a section called lighten. That's usually the, uh, the default, is the one called lighten. So if it's not on lighten, put it on there, uh, but it'll probably be on lighten. Uh, you don't really need to, need to deal with anything else. The images and in general, you could just leave alone. So 
the, the blending is really the important part to uh, pay attention to. And then there'll be an icon that says uh, start processing. So we'll click on that. And you'll see the, the, the little diagonal sun going up. And what it's doing is that it's, it's layering all these and stacking them together in one picture. So blending done. So, so, that, so now we're done. So that was, that was pretty quick. This is, this is a great, it saves a lot of labor. Uh, there, are, there are other ways to do this that are more labor intensive and, and maybe a little bit more accurate, but this is, this is pretty easy. That's why a sturdy tripod and everything in, in uh, making sure your camera doesn't move is crucial for something like this because now, now most of your work is done and you don't have to fiddle around with trying to adjust if there's a sun slightly out of, out of order or out of alignment. There was a question in the back. I shoot everything raw, uh, only because the, the, your, your camera, when it shoots a JPEG, it throws away a lot of information, and, and for, uh, for critical things, you, you need all of that information. With the, uh, if you don't know how to work with raw images, uh, often most cameras will have a raw plus JPEG setting. Uh, you could set it to that, and you could, you could work with the JPEG ones, and once you learn how to work with raw pictures, you might be able to go back and work on your previous pictures. Uh, once you learn how to work with the raw, but it's not difficult to work in the raw. If you work in Lightroom, you're you're essentially doing working with raw images. Uh, uh, it'll process a raw and a JPEG in the same way. Uh, with with the star stacks, uh, I think you have to have either TIFF or JPEG files for, for, for it to work, for it to do the stacking. And so uh, so you might have to just take all of your pictures, convert them, probably convert them to a TIFF first. It, it, it uses a lot of computer power, so it, it might be a, a little bit slower than what you saw here. Uh, but if you're if you're just patient, it'll it'll get through it'll get through the processing. Uh, and then so that all you need to do then you, you save that. I save uh, every time I process an image, I'll will save it as a as a TIFF. Uh, a, a TIFF file is an is an un, uncompressed file that it, it'll be the whole file. That'll be my master file uh, of that image. And you can go in and you can make any changes uh, uh, with, to that image without affecting the quality at all. And then you could um, de uh, decrease the size if you need to, save it as a JPEG if you want to post it somewhere or send an email. But a TIFF will be a very, uh, a TIFF will be the size of the picture as it's open in your computer. So the camera I shot with this, I think they're almost 60 meg files. So the TIFF will be a 60 meg file. The D800 and D810 cameras, the, the, the open file is 103 megs in Photoshop. So the TIFF file itself will be 103 megs in size. So it's a big, it's a big file, but memory is cheap. Uh, and it, if you've worked on a picture for a long time and you want to keep the, keep the quality, uh, the, uh, the, the, the memory is not going to be, uh, I think the memory is going to be the least of your problems. You, you want to save a good quality master file that you could go back to. Uh, and, and not have to make any changes to that. So I'll, I'll just save this as, um, as a TIFF to, where's our solar thing here? So that's, that's saved. And then I could go back, I, I, I can go into Photoshop and, and I can work on that. If you need to work on it, the picture anymore, uh, which, which you might not need to if you're, um, if your background image was good, if you created a good background image, then uh, and it's the it's the lightness or the darkness that you want, then then it's perfectly good. Then you could just resize this if you want, save it as a JPEG, and and, and post it. Uh, there was questions earlier about the lens angle and how high the sun is going to be. Uh, I took the data from the area that I'm going to be in Oregon and then figured out exactly what altitude the sun was going to be with the photographer's ephemeris, how high the sun will be uh, last Monday morning. And from, so from about 8.20 to 8.40 was the, a the a actual altitude it will be in Oregon where, where, where I'll be shooting from. And so this is a 20 millimeter lens, so you can see this, the, the, initially the sun looks pretty small when you look at the individual frames. But, uh, com Combined together on an image like this, so you kind of see the whole environment. You see the sun. It is pretty high in the sky, much higher than, than the uh, eclipse in Svalbard. Uh, but that's sort of 
that's optics, really. You can't really, uh, can't really do too much. But uh, the, uh, probably where you're, where I'll be, where you'll be, there'll be lots of people in the foreground. Uh, there might be mountains, trees, whatever, in in the location that you're at. So you so you might be able to fill the frame with other other things. Uh, it, it really kind of depends on on the location that you're at. You can also shoot a, a vertical image, probably with not not as wide of an angle lens. You might be able to do a vertical image here with about a say about a 28 millimeter or and or a 30 millimeter. The sun gets a little bit larger in the photo, uh, and and you'll you'll still get the get the same effect. So really, just kind of it really depends on where where you are, the the equipment that you have available. Yeah. To do uh, to do this, you wouldn't be able to do it. You you need one. Well, you could do it with one camera. The problem is the the light changes. Uh, somebody's going to try to do that. Right? Somewhere out there, someone's going to try to do that. I. I can't think of how to actually do it without doing using multiple cameras. With one camera, I think it would be very difficult because you wouldn't be able to get you wouldn't be able to get a progression like this and do a panorama at the same time be because you would you would well you you could do the panorama, uh, but you'd have to have one camera that's just shooting the, the partial eclipse sun. You can't move that camera at all. You can't do a panorama with that. Well, before the eclipse, you'll get a nice blue sky. You won't get a dark sky, which is what happens during totality. And the real, the, the real thing you want as the background image is the scene during totality. Because you don't care what it looks like during the partial phase. You care what it looks like during the total phase, what, what, what the environment looks like, what the sky is going to look like. And so if you're doing this panorama, you, you can't do the panorama and do the do the composite at the same time. It's uh, unless you're doing multiple cameras, and that I highly uh, don't recommend <laughs> doing that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the current background. This was a test. I, I went out to Carl Scherz Park on the East River, and I shot. I, I spent two and a half hours out there testing my equipment to make sure it works. And so, the the, the background picture is the picture of, with the sun. I took the filter off. Uh, I raised the shutter speed to about a four thousandth or eight thousandth of a second because the sun was pretty bright. Uh, and I shot a picture, and then I darkened the background a little bit and put it in uh, with this with this set of pictures. Uh, yeah. So you say when you make that background image during an actual totality, would you make several frames of different sources to choose from? Yeah, when I make the background image during totality, well, I make several different exposures. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that method that I talked to you about earlier, slowing the shutter speed down. So I'll have a whole series of from uh, four to five to six stops uh, over the initial exposure, where I'll get more and more of the corona. I'll get more and more of the of the foreground of my picture, people or, or whoever. There will be a lot of people where I'm going to be, so there will be a lot of people in the, in the picture. And then I'll be able to choose from that series of pictures which, which one, where essentially which one the sun looks the best, the, the best corona, because you don't, want, you don't want too much of a corona where you can't see the black part of the moon. The, 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 the great part of a total eclipse is that that all of a sudden, where the sun is supposed to be in the sky, you see this black dot. And it's, it's a disorienting thing at first, where you, you see the corona. So it, in most people's mind, the sun is this big yellow ball, and it's sort of fuzzy around the edge. I mean, in reality, it's, it's white, like in this picture. Um, and and it's, it's just the disk. But when you see this corona, there's this black circle in the middle. And, and, and so you want to retain that look uh, to, to the picture. So there could be some pictures where you might be too overexposed, but better a little bit over than, than, a, little, than a little under, which is my mistake on the first, first eclipse. Uh, yeah? Some people don't even use their high dynamic range, right? Oh, the, uh, should you use a high dynamic range? You could do, you could do that. Um, I'm not sure how that would work in the, in the camera. I would advise to not do it in the camera. You could do it in the processing afterwards, but um, 
it might be one more thing that you're adjusting on your camera at that time. The fewer things that you could adjust on your camera, the better. If, if all you're doing is changing the shutter speed, that's perfect because that means that you're just doing one thing, which means you're spending more time looking at the eclipse, which is the whole point of it. Uh, remember to look at the eclipse because uh, uh, you're going you're gonna to forget. You're, what, you're going to be putzing around with your camera. You'll be trying to change things. Something's not going to be working. And people will be going, ooh, ah, and you're, saying, you're thinking, what am I missing? What am I missing? <laughs> you're missing the eclipse. So, so, so keep, keep looking up, up at that eclipse because uh, it, it, is, it is something that you, will, you, you won't forget. Uh, there's another, um, there's another method that you could use uh, for the, for the uh, composite is you could just do the suns. So we'll, we'll just do, what I've done, I, I, I've taken out the background image and I'll just do the composite of the suns. Uh, so you, you get this image. Oops, what am I doing here? We're starting all over again. Okay, so, so you just have an image with the suns. Save it there. So I'll open that. And so that's just the partial eclipse sun uh, from, from your eclipse photo. And I'll go to, then I'll open the, my background image, the total of this. Imagine this is a total solar eclipse picture. And so I could adjust that uh, however way I want. Uh, I'm working now in Photoshop CC. Most, most uh, versions of Photoshop will, will have these tool, tools on it. And, it, it. and essentially, all you do is copy and paste. Uh, you, you, uh, you select the entire picture. You copy it. Uh, let's see. You select all. That will just select the entire picture. Uh, you copy it. So you're copying it onto your, uh, onto your computer. You go back to your background image, you paste. So uh, uh, you'll just see the sun, so don't panic. Uh, have, uh, under Windows, open up a box called Layers, because that'll, that'll give you all the information that you need to do the composites. Uh, you'll have the Layers box open, and then you'll be working in Layers. So my Layers box is over here. You see Layer 1 is the, uh, the cut and pasted uh, the copy and pasted layer. Background is, is the, our background layer. Uh, there'll be a pull down window here. It starts out at normal. Uh, you just go to lighten, which is the, the exact same command that was in the star fest. It's the same, uh, it, it, it's the same idea. You lighten, and it's basically combining those two, two images, one on top of the other. If you save this as a TIFF, Uh, save it with the, with the two layers. There'll be an uh, option where it says layers. You, you check that box. You hit save. It will tell you, um, hang on. I need to, oh, OK. You save it as a tip. You check the layers. You click OK. It'll say including layers will increase size, and so it, which means that your, your file is much bigger than it started out to be because there's a second layer now copied onto it. And you just click OK because you understand that. Uh, and so now you have a TIFF file, your master file, with two different layers on it. And say you, uh, you see, well, maybe that's not as dark as you remembered it. You can go back, open up your file. You can go on the background. And you could just darken the background. If I darken this all the way, the sun, the, the sun images don't change at all because all I'm changing is the background image uh, be, because I've saved that, uh, that one particular layer. So I'm just darkening uh, the background. And now I could, I could uh, to, to, to save that in a version that you could post and send to people, you go to layer, 
very bottom of the, the, the layers uh, tab is something called flatten image. What you're doing is that there's these two layers. One is on top of the other. We took the suns. We put it on top of the background layer. But there's still uh, a little gap between the two. They're not, they're not one image. Flatten, is, it does as it says. It flattens the images. It essentially pastes them together. And now they're both combined. And you, you can't work on each layer separately because they're both, they're both combined. But you can, you can save that particular file, uh, the flattened file. You can now save that. Uh, you can decrease the size. You can make it a smaller size if you want to post it. And you can save it as a JPEG to make it smaller, <coughs> make it easier for people to download and upload. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That's that's the uh, it's, it's essentially the foreground layer, and in, in, in Photoshop they call it the background layer. But yeah, the background layer is the uh, for for me, I I like that background layer to be the image during totality, because that's that's essentially <coughs> the uh, I don't know ninety nine percent of your picture. If you count up the area that the suns take up, very very tall small uh, small piece of real estate. Most of your picture is that is the background. Is what's what's the environment during totality? What's it what's it going to look like? Uh, and, and so that's really the most important one of the most important part of your pictures, other than keeping making sure all these suns are are aligned and equally spaced apart, because uh, that that just creates the uh, aesthetically the best uh, I think the best best type of picture. Uh, yeah. So now now you can save this. You can you can post it. You can crop it. Do anything you want to it. <laughs> you could. Um, you could just crop it to the to the suns if you want, and uh, and then you you you're creating a just uh, just a composite time lapse of uh, of the suns. So you could do with that file. You could you could do anything uh, anything you want with that. Uh, so that's that's probably the more complicated part of the processing. Uh, you don't have to really deal with any of this if you're just shooting the total phase, and then you could just forget about everything I talked about for the last hour. <laughs> and just concentrate on the instructions uh, of ex increasing exposure during totality. And then you, ha you just have to worry about two minutes of, of shooting, and then your day's done, and you're, and you're, and you're happy. Uh, Faisal. Yeah, is the question about flattening the image? Uh, do I need to flatten the image to save it as a JPEG? Y you don't really have to. Uh, it just makes it easier, uh, I think, to do it. I, I, I just kind of get into this habit. I flatten it, and then I save it as I, I, then I'll resize it and save it as a JPEG. Uh, because uh, the reason I'm doing flattening it is is because I want to post this somewhere or, or email it to somebody or post it on my website. So I I I, uh, I go to image size, and and then just make a um, I make a smaller picture. I mean, the, the picture out of most cameras are pretty huge. And by the time you, uh, a lot of people are seeing these things on their phone now. And sometimes your connection might be slow. So if you, if you just uploaded a smaller size file, it's just uploads faster, it downloads faster, and more people can see your, see your picture. Uh, let's see. So any more processing questions? Uh, do I calibrate uh, my monitor at home? I have a monitor that's calibrated. It's an NEC monitor, and I, I do. I, I have a, a Spider, the, a company called Spider S Y P D E R. Uh, they make a very a really good uh, calibrator for computer monitors. I, I do it because this is the work that I do, and so uh, the pictures that I produce they need to be properly calibrated. And I also do a lot of printing where I. I uh, sell prints. People uh, order order the prints that I make, and, and I do printing for exhibits that I do. So the the pictures themselves have to be properly calibrated. Uh, one one thing you could do in in Photoshop is under View, rather sorry, under Windows. There's a there's a um, window called Info, and that's that's open on the bottom left hand part of the screen here. And if you put the cursor on the image, uh, it shows you uh, on the left side, there's uh, three letters that say RGB. 
that's the red, green, and blue components uh, of your picture. If there's something that's um, if there's something that's gray in your picture, this is probably not a, a, a super good example. Something that's gray or white in your picture, and you put the uh, if you put the cursor on there, and the RGB numbers are all exactly the same or pretty close to the same. Uh, that means that that's a pretty neutral gray or, or a white color. And so no matter what it looks like on your computer screen, um, if you send that, say, to a lab to get printed, they'll know that that's uh, a, a neutral color. And so that then, because uh, a lot of things, a lot of uh, what happens is that your screen is not the same as the screen at a, at a printing company, at, at, a, at a lab, and so they'll see your picture differently, and they might adjust it, and you'll say, well, th it doesn't look the same. As, as, as what it looked on, on my screen. Or you might have a printer at home and you see it on your screen, you print it out and you say, well, that doesn't look like what was on that screen. It's because your, your screen is, it doesn't show the colors, pro colors properly. With, with, the, with the info, you could kind of get pretty close uh, w w within the ballpark so that you, could, you might be able to make minor adjustments, uh, but you'll be pretty, pretty close to that. So, uh, Again, uh, remember the safety, which I think I think everybody everybody here here will, and uh, have a, have a fun eclipse. The main thing is is just have fun. Make sure to watch the eclipse, uh, but have a good time wh wh while you're out there. And uh, uh, if uh, I'm a member also of the Amateur Astronomers Association, if um, uh, AAA.org is is the website, we have a pretty active astrophotography group. If you, if you join, uh, you can become a member of the astrophotography group, and we're going to have a little showing of the eclipse pictures on, I think, on August 31st, a couple, uh, week and a half afterwards. Uh, uh, our group is also on Instagram and Facebook. If you want to see any more of the photos that I took during the eclipse or any of the other work that I do, uh, my website is stanhonda.com. I'll, I'll put out a set of cards, and uh, uh, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook, so you could, you could see photos there. But, but definitely, if you're interested in astronomy uh, or interested in working with a pretty talented group of uh, photographers out there, uh, join the AAA and ask to join the, the astrophotography group uh, because it's, it's pretty active and uh, we've been, uh, people have been getting some pretty nice photos and there's a whole group of people going out to shoot the, shoot the eclipse, so, so you might actually run into, <laughs> run into some people out there. But I'll, tell you, I'll take any, uh, any more questions or I'll just hang out uh, if, if people have any more questions. Thanks a lot for uh, for coming. Is there a question? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, the pictures that I showed today from the eclipse, uh, they're on my website. Uh, uh, under new work, there's a there's a page that I made from the Svalbard eclipse, from the 2015 eclipse. So, so you uh, you can see them there, and and any other the other uh, photos that I that I've taken. Yes. Yeah. Right. Do you have another one that I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Bader is another company. Uh, B A A. I think B A A D E R. Yeah, they're uh, they're also a company that that manufactures uh, fil solar filters. Um, but I, I would check out uh, various camera stores, but also. Um, uh, astronomy websites uh, will, will often have. Website is, is very good. Pardon? Uh, the American Astronomical Association website. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, it sounds like the American Astronomical uh, Society. Society, AAS. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. AAS.org uh, is, is a good website to go for information also about the filters and, and the eclipse. But thanks, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you.